Good morning, a warm welcome to everyone joining this session on promoting healthy and sustainable diets in South Asia this morning, this afternoon, this evening, wherever you are in the world. Just as we have everyone joining, um, we'll do some brief housekeeping rules and welcome. Uh, my name is Helena. I'll be your moderator for the next 50 minutes in this affiliated session at the United Nations Food Systems Pre-Summit. Consumers International is a uh, network of consumer advocates, 200 consumer advocacy groups in 100 countries around the world in our preparations towards the United Nations Food Systems pre-summit and summit, uh, which is a historic moment where leaders will come together to talk about how we create nutritious, healthy, sustainable diets in a just and fair way. Uh, we've been working with our members to hear their voices. And I'm thrilled that our members in India and in Bangladesh in particular have worked together to propose um, what they feel are the core pillars of change and they're going to share those with you during this uh, session today. The statement, their statement, um, and also a global statement will be going up on uh, the Consumers International website, and we will share it with you here for the first time uh, today. So on the panel, and I'm going to, as I introduce them, I'd love them to say hi. Uh, we have Anusha Aya, who is from Consumer Education and Research Center. Anusha, could you say hi? You're on mute. We'll come later. George, welcome from Cuts. He's a director at uh, Cuts. Hello. Thank you. Wonderful. Saroja Sundaram is the executive director at the Citizen Consumer and Civic Action Group in Chennai. Hello, everyone. Wonderful. Ashim Sanyal is the COO of Consumer Voice. Big hello to everybody. Nazar Hossein is Vice President at the Consumers Association of Bangladesh. Yes, hello. And Shirish Dispande is the Chairman at Mumbai Grahak Panchayat. Hello. Wonderful. And you can see their faces there on the screen. We are delighted to be joined by Pawan Agawal, who's the Special Secretary at the Ministry of Commerce and Industry will be responding and reflecting on the comments from consumer advocates. So let's get good morning, going. Good morning, thank you. Wonderful, thank you for being with us. We really appreciate your presence and the opportunity for dialogue. So let's hear um, what are the pillars of the future food system in the eyes of consumer advocates? What must be on the agenda uh, for leaders uh, when they come together to talk about food systems in uh, September this year. Um, those pillars, and I think we may have this on the next slide, um, those pillars are consumer information, marketing and advertising, food standards, fiscal policy, public procurement, and improving supply chains. And those are fantastic core areas which must be addressed for meaningful change. So let's hear what we believe and what we think should happen and why from each of our advocates in turn. First, Anusha, can I hear from you? Why, what are we trying to do on consumer information? Why is it so, so important um, and what needs to happen next? Over to you. Thank you, Helena. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Anusha Ayer from Consumer Education and Research Center, India. And uh, a large consumer section in India consists of urban and rural poor who also have very low literacy levels. So it is imperative that their well-being, health, and safety should be the primary focus of uh, any policy change that India plans. And uh, where we are talking about promoting healthy and sustainable diet, the first step towards this is to affect consumer choices through effective consumer information. And uh, a consumer needs to be warned about what not to eat more than promoting what to eat. And uh, labels are a way to do so. Cons uh, you know, 
however the problem with labels is that majority of consumers are not equipped to read and understand these labels and add to this fact that india has a plethora of regional languages where consumers would know only one or two language so how do we tackle this issue uh we propose that to overcome these challenges what is needed is a unified front of pack warning symbol that warns consumers about the food being unhealthy and encourage them to turn towards making healthier food choices a prominently displayed warning symbol that indicates that the food is high either on fat salt or sugar would immediately catch the consumer's attention and would be easily understood even by illiterate people and such a symbol would also discourage uh, consumption of food that is high in fat salt or sugar which are uh, food components linked to ncds and obesity which is a major health concern in india uh, this symbol needs to be very easy to understand so that a uh, huge marketing campaign doesn't need to be put on board to make it more effective uh adoption of a warning symbol is something that uh, you know would motivate even the food industry to be more responsible towards making their food healthier and another thing which needs to be undertaken is a wide consumer awareness campaign on healthy and sustainable diets to encourage dietary changes this becomes very important because consumers are continuously hammered with advertisements and promotions of processed and very unhealthy food without any regard to the health outcomes of consumption of these foods so i'd like to conclude my presentation here by reiterating that empowering consumers with proper information will ensure consumption of healthy and sustainable diet thank you thank you so much anusha could i come back to you do you have an estimate for how much time or money is spent on promotion and information on healthy foods versus the spend and time are targeted to a consumer for unhealthy foods what would you say the balance is currently the, the balance is really lopsided towards unhealthy and processed food you pick up any especially now that olympics and uh, even cricket is going on you just turn on the tv and every ad break has a promotion of uh, processed food high on salt sugar or fat uh and when we are talking about sports channels and you know uh, sports events if uh, they have advertisements from such a heavily processed food it goes to talk about a lot on what kind of messaging and advertising we are going to talk about thank you anusha now because these two topics go together i am going to ask actually that we come to george before to nazir um george you were focused within this statement on marketing and advertising so following on from anusha what do you think needs to happen there why is the statement what's what does it say in the statement that you think is particularly relevant thanks helena <clears throat> under the marketing and advertising uh, specifically i will focus on the restrictions on the marketing of unhealthy food to children as all of us know in may 20 then the world health assembly adopted a global code of practice on the marketing of unhealthy food and non alcoholic beverages to children this was mainly to guide the member states to have new laws or to strengthen the existing law many countries had acted based on this code of conduct but india was one of the country which have not adopted any specific uh, uh, law based on this uh, global uh, code of conduct until recently we were guided only by a uh, a code for self uh, self regulation of advertising by the aski aski is the advertising standards council of india uh, which is a, a self regulating uh, body of the uh, the advertising industry and also in the cable television network act of 1995 and the cable television amendment act of 2006 we were having some provisions to restrict a uh, certain advertisement but recently the india's food regulator the food safety and standard authority of india uh, issued a, a notification and the food safety and standard safe food and balanced diet for children in schools regulation 2020 which came to existence on 1st of july 2021 uh, this is a very landmark uh, uh, decision i will say 
this regulation ban all sort of sale, promotion, and advertising of uh, food product high in uh, uh, fat, sugar, and uh, uh, salt. Though there is a strong opposition from the ultra processed uh, food uh, industry, this was debated for last several years, but uh, it came into force. Uh, but we need to wait and see because of the pandemic, the schools are closed. You know, this uh, uh, prevent uh, the school canteens in selling. And many of these uh, companies also were giving pro promotional uh, uh, activities like giving samples to the schools and things like that. Second one is the Consumer Protection Act 2019, uh, which uh, 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 restrict the celebratory endorsement. Why I mentioned uh, restrict. If somebody is uh, endorser is liable to fine of uh, rupees 10 lakh and one year ban on future endorsement for misleading uh, advertisements. Based on this Consumer Protection Act 2019, to uh, deal with the, uh, the, uh, the misleading advertisement, especially the unfair trade practices, a authority is also set up, the Central Consumer Protection uh, Authority which will oversee uh, 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 the implementation of uh, the thing. Mainly they are uh, looking into the misleading advertisement, falsely describes such product or service, gives false guarantee, conveys and express or implemented representation, deliberately conceals important information, all this aspect. George, you put yourself on mute. You need to come back, and then I need to finish you to finish in twenty seconds. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. There we go. Thank yeah. you so much, George, and uh, thank you for highlighting the progress in India and the opportunity to come. Um, I'd like now to go to Nazar. Nazar is, uh, I think, on the move, and so we'd like to bring him in early in the conversation in case um, he needs to leave uh, later on. Nazar, thank you so much for having contributed uh, the view from Bangladesh to this statement and across all of the different pieces. Um, within this statement, I think today you're going to pick up on the very important topic of public procurement. Could you talk to us a little bit about you know, why that particular point is so important and what you would like to see um, from the statement as a whole? Uh, thank you, Helena. Uh, I am sorry, I am from in, in a village in Cox Bazar and uh, we are in holiday now. So uh, basically I uh, received two person already explain about the issues. My topic is the uh, public procurement. So as you know, know about the food price, high, high always is a major, major food crisis in Bangladesh. Uh, public, when the public procurement is delay or low, then corporate group or uh, commercial uh, adventure, they are make, trying to make problem in the food drain or food stock and crisis. So we think the public uh, uh, public procurement, it will, it will be more uh, friendly to the farmers who are growers. If they're able to supply the, uh, their food drain to the, uh, directly to government, then it will be better for the consumer. Otherwise, consumer can get the, uh, raise the problem, consumer uh, face the problem to get uh, the whole my whole food process from the market because market always is in trouble and this is made by the corporate group. So public uh, procurement is if it is very easier for the grower or farmers, then consumer will get easily to the food market. So it will be help our um, healthy diet, ensure the healthy diet to our consumers. So public procurement is most important for our country. And as you know, in the, there is now for the lockdown on COVID situation, food price always being higher day by day. So some of the corporate group, they make uh, artificial, uh, artificial what call is uh, crisis in all over the country. So, if it, if it is continual 
It's a great pleasure, Nazir. Thank you, Thank you so you. much for joining. And um, as you'll see, sort of for participants, we'll go through the whole value chain. Um, but that yeah. public procurement, like I said, it's so important that bringing it to the front is, uh, is, is a good thing. Thank you for being here and um, thank you for contributing to, to the statement as a whole. Um, let's look at the next part of this. So we've talked so far about consumer information, marketing, advertising. We skip to public procurement. Let's come back to food standards um, because these are the silent pillars of a technological society. Um, let's hear about what needs to happen on food standards for health, for safety, and even maybe for data as well. So Roger, could you talk to us a little bit about this? Yeah. Thank you, Helena. So hello, everyone. I'm Saroja from Citizen Consumer and Civic Action Group, Chennai, India. So uh, I'm sure all of us will agree that well-developed and strictly enforced food standards are key to delivering healthy, safe, and sustainable food for all. So uh, our, uh, our Food Safety and Standards Authority of India has come out with several mandatory standards and uh, which actually help protect consumers uh, by ensuring that all food pro products meet with certain minimum conditions. So for example, I can say that very recently they have come out with the trans fat regulations, which actually limits the presence of trans fat and uh, oils and fats by 3% this year. And from next, uh, next year onwards, it will be further reduced to 2%. Trans fat is very harmful and uh, for one's health and with the increase in the non-communicable diseases and related deaths. I think this is a very good move by the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India to come up with these standards, which is actually one year ahead of the WHO mandated time. So WHO had said that we will eliminate, uh, that, uh, that trans fat will be eliminated from the food supply chain by 2023. And the Indian uh, authority, food safety authority has come up with regulations um, 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 uh, like reducing the limits. So several such standards are in place uh, that actually uh, uh, like are very uh, helpful and beneficial to consumers. So what we are looking for now is like what we think should be uh, uh, made available going forward is that there should be mandatory targets for reformulation of packaged foods, especially when uh, today high salt, sugar and fat are a major cause of concern for non-communicable diseases and uh, related deaths. So it's very important that there are a mandatory target set for reformulation of these nutrients of concern in packaged food. 
So that is one thing that uh, we should be working towards. And also, the other thing is strengthening safety standards for street food. Street food is a significant part of the diet in the uh, for Indian consumers, actually. So there, sanitation, sanitary and hygienic requirements for street food vendors need to be promoted. So though we have some uh, requirements to be met, I think implementation plays a major role so we have to engage continuously with these street food vendors to actually um, uh, like educate them on the importance of hygiene and sanitation. So that is another uh, uh, point that we need to be focusing on. And um, uh, the other point that we should be focusing on is about, uh, we talk about sustainable food. So when we talk about sustainable food, I think um, uh, organic certification is very important and like when we talk about organic certification, the consumers should be confident that they are buying only those products that are genuinely organic. So that certification marker plus the, um, the monitoring to ensure that it is the original marking that is available on food products. So that needs to be ensured uh, and the eco mark that needs to be promoted a lot. So this is another important, uh, uh, when we talk about standards, I think this is also uh, very important. And um, uh, most important is to have a very good monitoring and enforcement uh, system. So that is where very often we lack. So it's very important that we have an effective enforcement system in place so that these standards are effectively uh, uh, like uh, implemented, uh, practiced. So. For that to actually for when we talk about implementation, I think uh, I should definitely talk about the food testing uh, laboratories in the country. So we do have accredited public laboratories, but then uh, very often infrastructure uh, is a may, is a problem. So either there is um, uh, lack of manpower or lack of uh, uh, effective uh, equipments uh, to do the testing, or and the other is the uh, issue of affordability. So so is it. Uh, cost effective so that consumers can approach these laboratories to get food products tested. So these are something that we need to look into. And um, uh, also, I think it would be good to have, uh, to integrate consumers into the system. So if you have some uh, platform, uh, uh, like our social media um, uh, uh, platforms where citizens will be able to report if there is a problem. Uh, so in my state, from the state that I come from, Tamil Nadu, so there is a um, system by which there is a WhatsApp number that is shared um, uh, with the consumers across the state. So if there is a complaint, if there is a, if they identify adulteration, if they find the food of, to be of no uh, of good quality, then they can register a complaint on that number, which goes to the food safety department directly, and they are supposed to take action immediately. So this is something that we should be actively promoting amongst consumers and action should be immediately, action taken should be immediately communicated to the consumer so that uh, it uh, the system gains trust basically. So yeah, so basically this is what I think we should be doing, uh, looking at going forward. Uh, thank you, Helena. Thank you, Saroja, fantastic. With very practical and specific points there. Thank you so much. With that, I'd like to go to Ashim who's going to pick up the topic of fiscal incentives. Ashim, two minutes for you. When we talk of uh, fiscal policies, in fact, uh, it's a macro level subject and one of the most difficult for any professor of economics to teach in two minutes, in fact, but I'll try my level best, in fact. So what is a fiscal policy uh, that is incorporated in the Indian system? In fact, it's basically has to do with government uh, <clears throat> Uh, deciding how much to invest in the food processing industry. I'm sticking to that, in fact, and how much economic support it requires and uh, what kind of revenue generation it can potentially give to the country and to the corporates uh, who run it, in fact. Uh, so the objectives basically are economic growth, price stability, and uh, <clears throat> full uh, employment of people, in fact. Uh, there is a difference between uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy. I'm not going to do that. But let's understand the food industry first. In fact, food processing industry in India. The food processing industry sector in India, incidentally, employs uh, around 42% of a population, which is huge, and contributes around 16 to 17% of the GDP. This is, again, a huge contribution. It is valued at around US dollar 1.8 billion. 
and uh, <clears throat> a, a growth potential of 22%, which has been marked as uh, one of the stupendous growth thing. Now, what has India got embedded in the system, which helps uh, regulators and <clears throat> people in the ministries to actually help? It's got the National Food Processing Policy, it's got the National Food Security Act, and it's got the National Food Processing Fund, which is, uh, uh, I mean, disbursed by NABAD, which is <clears throat> a bank owned by Government of India. Now, the key principles is basically to have an enabling environment for everybody, all players, including consumers and uh, obviously the, the corporates, in fact. Now, the food processing in the industry basically gets a lot of mega promotions from the government of India because India is an agro-based system and it's important that we promote this particular system uh, to the health in fact and government of India is doing that by giving them actually uh, a lot of free power, free, free energy in terms of, uh, uh, um, I mean, the, the, the processing industries, uh, we give uh, free, a lot of credit and we wave of water charges so there are a lot of in incentives, in fact. Now, when we talk of fiscal policies, these incentives actually promote a so-called ecosystem, which should match the consumer needs. Now, there is a mismatch there, despite having a national food po processing policy. Incidentally, I'll close down by stating something which is very important for any regulator or any policymaker to understand. The objective of the food policy of India has embedded in it the issue of to address the issue of malnourishment by ensuring availability of nutritionally balanced foods that's embedded in our system, adequate and stable supply of safe and nutritious, nutritious food for all that's embedded in our system, to ensure adequ adequate nutrition for all, especially for women and children. This is again embedded in the food policy of India. Now, the importance is that we have policies in place, we have systems in place, we have uh, regulations in place. Question is how do we apply it and how does it actually affect the fiscal balance? I'm quite sure that this is a revenue generation uh, generating sector and everyone in, in India is attracted towards, all the MNCs are attracted towards uh, food processing, in setting up food processing industry. So important is, they have to balance it towards nutrition, health, and obviously, <clears throat> very importantly, the consumer health has to come as a priority for them. And when we talk of high sugar, salt, and fats, in fact, this is mainly embedded in the last mile, which is the processed and the ultra-processed foods. This has to be controlled because uh, the cereals and the, 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 the pulses, in fact, they don't carry this kind of a, a, a problem. It is the processed food which has this particular problem. This needs addressing, and some of the speakers have already spoken. The front of pack labeling, warning signs should actually be there because, as you have, as I indicated, this industry is growing fast. Also, because the e-commerce sector is growing by 31 percent, which is huge, and the food delivery systems of uh, Swiggies and Dunzos and uh, Zomatos, uh, which is delivering food, especially in the pandemics. They have grown by, I mean, amazingly 43% during this 18 months period. So you get packed food at home, whether by choice or by design. So I think what is required is last mile delivery control. Thank you, Elena. Brilliant, Ashin, thank you so much. And I, I do feel ashamed for asking you to pack your brilliance and all of the panelists to pack your brilliance into two minutes um, for further discussion. Um, I'd like to come to Shirish uh, now to help us think about supply chains. Um, why are they in this statement? What do you think could be approaches to improve? Shirish. Uh, thank you, Helena. Uh, it's a good exercise to see how do we get to the entire healthy and sustainable diet for the consumers. And in that, definitely the supply chain of a food that the food which is produced at the farm and which ultimately reaches your pop in the hands of the consumer. How does it travel? That is very important. And that is why the supply chain management in any food system is very important. In fact, if we analyze the food supply system or food supply chain, 
we find that there are areas or there are intermediaries which have a potential or even at times they do create the problems like the adulteration substandard products to be inserted and wastage packaging which is environmentally not friendly is not eco friendly transportation which is rather uneconomical in fact take the example of all your e platforms today they supply the food at your asking whenever you want so i ask for the food i get it between 8 to 12 time slot my neighbor ask the food in the evening 4 to 8 the same e platform again comes there so it is a uneconomical transportation for the food delivery so food delivery has to be managed economically in order to ensure that the consumers get affordable healthy and you know nutritional food that should be sustainable how do you do that so the supply chain has to be shortened now short not only in terms of a geographical distance what it means in the supply chain we have number of players right from the producer who is a farmer till the end user that is a consumer now intermediaries like wholesalers stockists distributors and then the retailers and then the consumer can we eliminate that that is the challenge before any person or any government or the any society which is addressing the issue of healthy and sustainable diet what you need to do or what perhaps government can encourage is building a bridge directly between the farmers who are the producers of the food to the consumers who are the users of the food. now if the supply chain is done directly and i think government of india i am very happy is trying to do that but that is trying to do that through the digital platforms and all that at the same time at the ground level or the grassroots level the government needs to do it by encouraging the civil society private players and eliminate the things so it becomes a cost effective again it is a the moment you reduce the transport then in that case there is a lot of environment positive impact is there you know the carbon emission through the transportation can be reduced i can tell you that mumbai gram panchayat has been practicing a model of the supply chain which is directly from the farmers to the consumers direct to a group this buying of the food items and also direct group distribution so that ensures the economy that ensures the healthy diet and that also ensures a sustainable lifestyle you know i mean we use the packaging also we encourage uses of the cloth bags and that you use and use and use thereby eliminate the plastic now these are the examples which the government must take note of seriously we have been doing it for 46 years now this is something government must think how such models can be rep replicated by the others how such models can be duplicated or how they can be incentivize and encourage by the others in the civil society so this is a big challenge for the government that see these models promote the civil society encourage them incentivize them use the digital platform for that but at the same time the way the other digital platforms are doing it asking delivery at any time discipline that clustering is required economy is required sustainable consumption has to be a focus on that so if you do that then a lot can be achieved and improvised economical and efficient food supply system we can have it thank you thank you very much shirish and in fact we've been looking as consumers international across multiple countries for where um there is support to new business models that connect farmers and consumers using ethical approaches for digital and data and of course that is a huge opportunity um for uh multiple places so um pawan if i can come to you now thank you so much for joining us this morning we really appreciate uh your willingness to listen to these points from across uh our consumer advocacy members um we are in a pre summit for uh the united nations food system in preparation for uh the head of state meeting in september 
Could you give us your perspectives on the future of food policy in India? Could you give some responses and advice back on how consumer advocates can engage more and your thoughts on the comments you've heard? And perhaps uh, some advice on how we bring those uh, two leaders as part of the United Nations Food System Summit. Thank you, sir, to you. Thank, thank you, Helena. You know, I'm delighted to be here uh, in this webinar uh, and uh, see some old faces and old acquaintances. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, going through uh, what six consumer advocates had to say, I was reflecting on my time at the Food uh, Safety and Standards Authority of India, you know, that there are many things that we were doing right. And uh, I cannot agree with what every one of them said. You know, they are all very good points. The six pillars you have identified are, you know, perfect. Uh, but I would, you know, in my response to, uh, because there's nothing much to add to what they've already said. So I would take a little different approach to, to look at, to unpack the entire issue of uh, promoting healthy, and sustainable diets uh, somewhat differently. You know, I would like to unpack the issue healthy diet in two parts. One is the unsafe food, safe food, safe and hygienic food. And second is the nutritious food. Now, as far as safe food is concerned, it is government's responsibility to ensure that people have access to safe food. And for which you obviously require uh, robust standards, you require businesses to comply with those standards. And in an Indian kind of a scenario or South Asia where food sector is evolving and there are a large number of small and petty operators. So obviously you cannot use the same instruments of regulation for small businesses as you may like to use for big businesses. You have to have a capacity building approach. Uh, a lot of focus on building capacities of food businesses to provide safe and hygienic food to the market. So absolutely no doubt about it that there it is primarily the role of the government, the regulator and the businesses, but it helps if consumer advocacy groups starts, you know, reaching out to the consumers and, you know, making that distinction between what food is safe and what food is not safe. And if there is a demand from consumers, for safe food, it helps the cause for food safety. And that is where, you know, uh, the little distinction between safe food and next is the nutritious food. On nutritious food, because the food is nutritious or less nutritious, but if it is as per standards, the government cannot, you know, prevent businesses in producing that kind of well, if, if we can't bring him back, we may need to ask our consumer advocates for a response to that cliffhanger he left us with. Um, Ashim, can I come to you? Uh, Pawan just cut off there, so we'll try and bring him back. But his last comment was, we need to separate safe and nutritious. And safe government can take action on, nutritious government perhaps cannot. Could you just quickly respond to that? And we can pick up with Pawan when he's able to join again. Yeah, sure. Uh, <clears throat> this was uh, his stand when he was the CEO of uh, FSSAI. In fact, he always maintained that our basic uh, objective is basically to ensure uh, safe food for all, in fact. But I just spelled out the, the policies that India has, which does mention uh, nutrition also as uh, a part of the delivery system of, the, of uh, every government, in fact, and especially the Indian government. So, I mean, definitely what is said was correct in terms of, you know, not being able to mandate the nutrition part of it, but obviously the government can coerce the industry towards that. So there is a different approach. Uh, he himself mentioned, mentioned about few approaches that we have to uh, basically uh, apply in terms of small scale industries and large scale industries. So similar approaches absolutely for safe food and nutritious food. Normally, I would always argue, and I've, I've argued before him and everybody, in fact, anything that is safe food, in fact, normally is nutritious food. Normally is nutritious food, in fact. So if you can ensure uh, safe food delivery, then you're eliminating the, the, the unsafe or unhygienic part of it, in fact, 
which makes the food actually edible because every food cannot be called as food unless they are one edible in terms of taste number two they are safe and number three comes the element of nutrition which is very very important from consumer point of view and i think he is the person who started eat right india and nutrition was added on so probably he's got a lot more to say in, the, in that particular part of it he was the person who added nutrition to the entire subject of food safety well, let's see if Pawan is, is back. I think we saw your video come back on. Pawan, would you like to rejoin? And are you, are you able to rejoin? Let's see if Zoom and technology works for us. Maybe still not, in which case I'd like to come to Anusha and also George. You kicked us off talking about consumer information and um, marketing and advertising. Um, do you uh, any any thoughts about um, uh, the uh, importance of bringing together? I'm just reflecting yesterday on the global conversation where one of our youngest consumer advocates said, "You can't separate safe, healthy, and nutritious." For us as young consumers, um, these things are one and the same. Actually, safe equals healthy and nutritious. And I wonder how uh, we advance that uh, through better consumer information and marketing and advertising. Anusha. Uh, I agree to what uh, Mr. Pavan said. Well, he said that you know, creating awareness with consumers and where civil societies and NGOs have to work, uh, that would create uh, the demand where we, we create awareness among consumers that this is the, you know, identify what is safe food, what is nutritious food, what is healthy food. And once the consumers are empowered to make this choice and are able to identify what is safe, what is nutritious, then comes where they'll start demanding for such food. And when there is enough demand and enough pressure from uh, all stakeholders, uh, the, the manufacturers will also look to uh, forward to become uh, more responsible with their products being yeah. healthy, safe, and nutritious. Perfect. Thank you. I see, Pawan, you may be back. We can see you. I think we're still sorting this out. Could you unmute? Because we'd love you to rejoin again. Yeah. Oh, I'm so oh. sorry. You know. No I'm problem. Lovely to have you sorry. And so I think I will I will just touch upon two small points because I've lost my time. Uh, the second point is on nutritious food. On nutritious food, while front of the pack labeling is a good idea, and I think uh, I personally endorse it, but uh, to raise awareness amongst the public, amongst the consumers, to make a sense out of front of pack labeling is a long uh, journey. And uh, in India, where packaged food uh, is a very small proportion of the overall food that people consume. So you require, you know, I think to engage with the consumers that they should be opting for healthier food, whether cooked at home or street food or uh, even in informal environments, uh, rather than purchasing, uh, you know, uh, packaged food. On sustainable diets, that's far more challenging. There, you know, while nutritious food, you can make a case to consumers that uh, this food is good for you, but food that is good for the environment, good for the planet, is very difficult for common men to understand and recognize. And therefore, what we had done in India was, you know, we started a campaign called Eat Right Movement. Eat Right Movement had three pillars, safe food, nutritious food, and sustainable diets. And the approach is not only consumer information, but engage with the consumers, excite them about the three aspects of food, and then enable them to make their changes in their own lives to demand safe, nutritious, and food and sustainable diets. I think this comprehensive approach is something that is needed across the world in different countries. In India, we have made a beginning. We are making good progress on that. As we speak, one third of the country is already part of the Eat Right movement through a Eat Right District Challenge, Eat Right City Challenge. But consumer advocacy groups can play a very, very important role in creating a demand for safe and nutritious food and sustainable diets across the board. 
and uh, work with the government and businesses to make that happen. I'll close my remarks here. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. Thank you so much. And I'd love to give you back some time. Um, how do we practically do that as a next step? So from this conversation in responding to your invitation for consumer advocates to help on that point, um, what would you suggest that we that we put in place that goes beyond where we are now, recognizing the, the urgency and importance of that task? Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, these kind of campaigns uh, are not really centralized campaigns. These campaigns are pretty much decentralized campaigns and consumer advocacy groups work in different areas. So wherever they exist, wherever they have influence, you know, work with the local authorities and start their campaigns by themselves, you know, and uh, we had started engagement with the consumer advocacy groups uh, about a couple of years back in food authority. Uh, we could not reach it to the logical conclusion, but I think it is opportunity in the wake of the UN Food uh, System Summit that there's a renewed interest in the food system transformation. Consumer advocacy groups can really come forward and uh, take the lead in this. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think there's enormous potential for consumer advocacy. Of course, the challenge is always capacity and uh, making sure that the resources are there to support NGOs and civil society. So um, approaches where uh, that sort of endorsement and support can help with capacity building, you know, how, what advice would you take for consumer advocates seeking capacity building in this particular space? Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, networking the consumer the way you have done it for 200 uh, you know consumer advocacy groups across the world across the world i think in india uh, such efforts need to be strengthened because it is the power of network and working together that can make a difference and uh, there's other civil society organizations in fact i'm i'm connected with the food future foundation where we intend to work with consumer advocacy groups uh, you know, uh, very deeply as we move forward, because uh, capacities of consumer organizations will continue to be an issue. And that has to be addressed as we move forward. Perfect. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you joining today to listen to the call for action and for responding and giving some very practical and thoughtful strategic um, remarks. I'm going to steal an additional 20 seconds from each of our panelists. I'd like um, your uh, ask to those listening uh, who are many consumer ad advocates from around the world. How should we use the opportunity of the United Nations Food Systems Summit uh, to make sure that consumer rights and responsibilities are at the forefront um, and involved in the conversation effectively? I'm going to go in the same order as before. I'm going to ask for 20 second response, okay? Three words probably. Anusha. What should the group listening take as a call to action? Um, I think we've summed up everything very well here. What I would want is that we uh, join hands in creating awareness and ensuring that uh, the call for action that we have decided has uh, a productive and concrete steps taken towards them. Uh, and by the time that uh, we have the summit in September, there are some uh, productive uh, outcomes out of it and some serious steps being taken towards achieving these, these, these points that we've raised. Perfect. Thank you. George, three words, 20 seconds, call to action. Yeah, as mentioned by everybody, the low level of awareness is a, a big challenge in a country like India to generate the genuine demand for healthy and sustainable diet, we need to uh, enhance this. But it is a challenge, you know, it has to be funded by the state and all. It is a long-term uh, strategy. That is the other thing also, you know, the weak enforcement of the law is also one of the reasons for the, uh, uh, the low level of uh, awareness. But for the purpose of the, the food summit, I think we have gathered uh, all the information through the consumer organization and collectively we need to advocate for taking these concerns forward. Thank you. Thank you. Saroja, so your call to action to the group. So uh, I second uh, George's views. I think we need to promote uh, whatever statement. I think we have, we have put our thoughts together in coming up with this statement. I think 
we need to advocate for this to make sure that everything is falls in place so that consumers get safe and uh, uh, healthy, uh, healthy, sustainable uh, food going forward. Nazir, if you no, oh, we've we've lost Nazir, but thanks to him, and we will come back to him. Uh, Shirish, your call to action, twenty seconds. Shirish, unmute, please. You're on mute. Yeah, am I audible? Yeah, okay. All that I say that we have practiced this sustainable lifestyle and uh, innovative distribution model in MGP for last 46 years. So all that I would say, follow MGP. Instead of looking at the government for doing certain things, let the consumer advocacy groups themselves follow the MGP's model of food distribution system. So you can deliver the things in a more sustainable way, ensure the healthy diet for the consumers, and that's all. Perfect. Thank you. And Ashim, round us off. What's your call to the uh, those who are listening from around the world? I think uh, most importantly, uh, consumers uh, organizations should become a, a regular stakeholders in all the deliberations that take place uh, in terms of safe and nutritious food, which is the case in India. We should be more participative in that. Uh, we are giving uh, given a lot of opportunities. Second, creative creations of smaller uh, subgroups uh, in the regions, in the districts, in the cities uh, are absolutely essential for spreading the awareness in terms of safe, nutritious and sustainable foods. Third, most important thing is uh, organizationally, we must continue to engage the grassroots level organizations uh, that exist today and give them lessons about the chapters that we have learned, uh, learned till now or have discussed uh, or will be discussing during the summit. In fact, I think it's important that we convey our messages at the grassroots level and things probably will take shape from that ground level action. Thank you so much. So all that remains to do uh, this morning is uh, to thank all of those who took part in crafting this statement together over the past weeks in the run up to the summit. Um, thank you to those of you joining. Really appreciate your time today. And I hope this has been what I think has been a fascinating and useful discussion uh, and exchange. And thank you, a sincere thank you to our panelists here today um, and to uh, all of you for contributing your thoughts and compressing brilliance into a very short space of time. We look forward to continuing uh, to connect. Uh, Pawan, uh, a wonderful invitation from you to continue on the journey towards a fair, safe and sustainable marketplace. Uh, and a healthy and climate smart diet for all of us. Uh, to everybody, thank you for joining. Stay safe, stay well, stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all.